I've said it before and I'll say it again, Alan Turing was an ultra mega super genius and an amazing engineer. Perhaps best known for making the single biggest contribution to ending World War II, at least according to Winston Churchill, Turing helped shorten the war by an estimated two to four years by cracking intercepted coded messages from German forces. Sadly, he's also known as a man whom society did not treat well during his lifetime because he was gay in a time when being so was actually illegal. He was a brilliant mathematician, a war hero, and he led a short but full life. And recently, Graham Moore and Morton Tildum wrote and directed, respectively, a feature film about Turing's life and his code-breaking work during World War II. The film is the imitation game, and when they finished shooting it, Graham and Morton were kind enough to answer some of my questions about how they translated both the science and the man to film, including why they cast Benedict Cumberbatch for the part of Alan Turing. So, through the magic of green screen and the kindness of strangers with cameras, Question one. Writing a historical character is always a challenge, but writing about one who's so important both scientifically and socially seems exceptionally challenging. What work did you do to come to understand Turing's personality? Alan Turing was a truly unique uh, individual in, in the history of science and, and in history. He was um, one of the great minds of the 20th century and, and a truly original thinker and an original human being. So, um, you know, there's always something intimidating about writing about one of the great geniuses of the 20th century because I am certainly not. Um, so the trick, I think, for me uh, and all of us was just research, 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 to read as much about Alan Turing as possible. So Turing's accomplishments were not, like, uncomplicated. How did you go about trying to communicate them in the movie? The actual math he had is extremely complex. We had a math expert on the set. We also had somebody explain how his machine really works. And when they start to explain it, you sort of look around and everybody has panic in their eye because it is extremely complicated. It is, it, it's, uh, I'm not embarrassed to say that most of it just flew over my head. And for a storyteller, it's, it's hard to grasp it. It's not necessarily the, what's important. I think it's more important to understand the concept of his ideas. There's this amazing connection between Alan Turing's incredibly complicated, breathtaking uh, mathematical and philosophical work and his personal life. And I think that was something we were all fascinated by in making a film about him, because we wanted to make a film that really showed and brought to life who Alan Turing was as a person and showed how that affected his, his sort of brilliant and revolutionary thoughts. I think that when you talk about Alan Turing's imitation game, which in a nutshell is this concept that we are only what we are, we are only what we can convince other people that we are. We are human to the degree that we can convince mm. someone else that we are human. Um, I think that for a statement like that to come from a closeted gay man in Britain in the 1930s is remarkable. And, and in Turing's work on the imitation game, and therefore in Turing's whole sort of conceptualization of modern AI, you see um, a man who has to imitate every day. You see the, the, the mind of someone who has to pretend to be someone who he's not every single day because he's a gay man living at a time when um, that his homosexuality was not simply frowned upon, but, but literally illegal. And so I think that connection between the personal and the philosophical was tremendously important for all of us as we worked on the film. So what about Benedict do you think made him right for the part? Uh, when I read his script, I immediately had Benedict in mind for the part of Alan Turing. Um, he was the first one I talked to, and he was the only actor I really approached for the part. Uh, I remember having this Skype conversation where I tried to convince him to do the part, and he tried to convince me to be part of the movie. So, I mean, he read the script and had this phenomenal understanding and, and love for Turing and the character. Uh, Alan Turing is, is we, I mean, first of all, we, we didn't want to make sort of like the cliche math professor, whimsical thing. We, I mean, he's a truly unique character. He's so strong, so driven, almost arrogant and at the same time so awkward, so uh, fragile. And in the core of this is this young boy who lost so much. I mean, Alan Turing is a man who carried secrets his whole life, you know, as a closeted gay man, and then being involved with MI6, and, you know, the layers and layers of secrets that was just burdened upon him. Uh, I think that Benedict is able to portray all these elements all at the same time. I mean. 
he, he's creating this complex character that is kind of hard to define, but is truly unique and very fascinating. That's pretty cool that apparently you could just get Benedict on Skype whenever you want. Were there any uh, fascinating science bits you uncovered in your research? Sure. I mean, I think, I think when you talk about Alan Turing, you're talking about a mind that was so breathtaking in, in sort of the, the width and variety of scientific sort of inquiry it was pursuing. You know, we, there's all this stuff we wish we could have included in the film, like his work on morphogenesis, a lot of his biological work, mm. his work on plants, his amazing work um, on the stripes of tigers. It was like, when you're talking about Turing, it's like, when did he have time to sort of theorize how tigers got their stripes? But he did, in between breaking the German Enigma code and inventing the computer in his off time, uh, on one of his many Sundays off, he somehow like theorized where tigers got their stripes. And there was this sort of, you got the sense of a mind that just, just never stopped exploring, never stopped thinking. And so there are, there's so many theories like that, that you're like, when did he even do this? How did you figure out how to visualize and write and show the process of science, the scientific process, the exploration and the moments of inspiration? You, you, you know, you need to go through, you need to sort of like try to find the drama in this. You try to find the surprise and be there when the moment, like I, I, scientific discoveries, I mean, it happens over time in real life. We, we have to make moments. Movie making is all about moments. It's that second where you get this epiphany of an understanding of what goes on, and, and that is what you have to capture. You have to try to create that. While probably it's, you know, somebody sitting on a desk, and when they get an idea, they're very quiet, and then they have to sort of like <laughs> try and figure out more and whatever. But we have to make moments out of it. We have to, be, to, we have to make this understandable and engaging. So, so, so to us, you know, everything dealing with an understanding, like a eureka moment or an epiphany, it's all about Ah, now I got it. Was it hard to balance scientific accuracy with making the most compelling movie? You know, all of our goal with this film was was to create uh, was to create a movie that really celebrated Alan Turing's legacy and hopefully brought um, Alan Turing's story to a wider audience. And that meant making an accessible film, making a film that that people could could understand, uh, that a broad audience could understand while doing justice to, to his legacy. So I think when we were talking about the science, you know, the first goal was never condescend to the audience. And so that meant we could sort of talk about the big concepts that he, that he came up with and try and express those to an audience and expect them to follow along. Um, you know, that was something that, that was important to all of us. I think that a lot of times films about scientists sort of cut out the science. Um, they think that an audience doesn't care or isn't interested or doesn't want to follow along. And we wanted to really rebel against that in some way. We wanted to say, no, this is why Alan Turing was great. This is why he was one of the great minds of the 20th century. Um, it is these theories that are the reasons why we're, we're, he needs to be studied now and remembered now um, and, and to hope that a, a smart uh, audience can follow along with us. We here are all about not condescending to the audience. Uh, were there any moments that made you feel like maybe you shouldn't get too scientific, but then decided you needed to get into it? We needed to, let's see how they broke the code. I mean, it is, you needed to follow the way, I mean, the step-by-step -step thinking, you know, to come up the idea, like, this is how, you know, crib-based uh, decryption, like, the, the, how he come up with the ideas that there's actually repeatable or uh, words that you know you can expect to be in a message unless lock onto those words. That kind of thinking uh, and the way that used uh, weather reports, uh, silly, which is you know uh, uh, in the movie, all of these are the actual things we wanted to have that and trying to do it step by step. And it's also one of the most thrilling parts of the movie. So so uh, we didn't want to simplify that too much, but um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's always a discussing like how he discusses. The, uh, you know, the universal machine, the, uh, you know, the digital computer, uh, the scene between him and Kira, how much in detail should we go there? And we decided that that scene was sort of like a first meeting between them. Uh, and it's more about that. And he, still, he is allowed to explain his idea that a machine that can actually make its own decision on what to do next based on, you know, uh, what he did before, like he computes something and then he makes another decision. Just that idea, and that is, it's not, uh, it's only programmable, it's reprogrammable. Just all of those ideas, which was revolutionary. 
So we have them, but we, but we also find out we can't go into more detail. Then the movie will stop up and we will have like an hour discussion between the two characters. Finally, I just wanted to ask about Turing's legacy. Is being a part of that intimidating? Yeah, I think that, you know, Alan Turing's legacy is of someone who was so sadly had to be an outsider in his own time, but precisely because he was such an outsider, he saw the world in a way that no one else did. And because he saw the world differently, he was able to have these ideas. He was a totally unique thinker. And I think what we want people to take away from the film and from Alan Turing's life is that it is precisely the things that make you unique, that make you different, that allow you to see things that other people can't, that other people don't, and that those differences are something to be celebrated and cherished, um, not washed away. Thank you so much for doing this, Graham and Morton, for studying and remembering Alan Turing with the imitation game. We here at SciShow can't get enough of great minds like Alan Turing's, and we are glad that we're not alone. And thank you, SciShow audience, for watching this special SciShow News interview. If you want to continue remembering Alan Turing, the imitation game opens tonight throughout the U.S. And if you want to keep getting smarter with us, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe.